Hi guys, welcome back to the Talking Rangers YouTube channel. I'm delighted today to be joined for a Q&A and a look back on all things QPR with Mr. QPR, Mr. Blue and White, live from the Bahamas uh, to talk everything on these topics. How are you doing, Mark Bircham? I'm good, I'm good. Look, if the sun's getting on your nerves, I can't really help it. It's only eight o'clock in the morning and it's still like that. I don't need to get annoyed with it. So that's the best I could do. I tried to find a place where the sun weren't getting in the way. He's just, he just told me that he, uh, he nearly, nearly did this interview on the beach. So we'll, uh, we'll take this as a oh, start. Yeah, I, I, didn't want to lie, I didn't want to mind people that were knocked down. But on the other hand, I've got a ridiculous facial hair for this interview because it is Movember. I just wanted to prove to people, look, I haven't just amended it. There's lots of grey in there. I was getting a stick the other day. It was just the lighting. Oh, gosh. So um, if you don't mind me saying, I think it's been a bit of a crazy year for yourself um, from all the way from yeah. being behind bars and to now technical director of the Bahamas. How are you finding the role? Yeah, no, it's good. It's good. It's hard work because I suppose in lockdown, FIFA and Conga CAF have putting on Zoom meeting after Zoom meeting and it's, it's, it's a lot of planning and preparation for next year. There's lots going on. We've got, uh, of course, the Men's National Team World Cup qualifiers in March where we've got the legend that is Terry Fennick in our group because he's from Trinidad, he's um, manager of Trinidad, so it'd be great to see Terry. Uh, then we've got, again, we've got the women's team. So we've got national women's team, U17s and U15 boys and girls, and then also starting up a centre of excellence here. So yeah, it's just, it's just been full on, and, but it's been good. I've been kept busy, so I can't complain. No, very good. Very good. I mean, um, it's great to see you back in a, in a good role in football, but I mean, there's all one job we want to see you have further down the line. But um, we'll get into it. We'll get straight started. Uh, starting off back at the beginning, um, your years at, you had many years as QPR um, as a youngster and left and had six seasons at Millwall before joining again back in 2002 uh, to join the R's. Now, what I, want to, what I want to get into is obviously, as you said, you, when you left Millwall, you signed a pre-contact agreement that was already signed. You had offers from the Premier League. And you joined QPR for less money, which at a point in, you know, young family and financial security must have been a big thing for you. Um, and of course, don't get me wrong, I'd love to pay for QPR. And I know you had a dying desire to. But what was kind of the, the driving factor behind that? Because at the end of the day, as well, you, being in the Premier League, is, is a, you know, that's for your career. You've got to fulfill you know, your career aspirations. What was that burning desire? But it was just my, my dream. Me and my, me and my whole family are all QPR fans. So... Uh, me and my older brother, I used to go like home and away all the time. My, my dad, when we was younger, and it was just my whole dream was to like play captain and just play to keep the and do well. So it was a bit hard. I've always people that know me, I've always gone on my gut feelings. It's always done me well. And then when I was at Mill and signed that free agreement with the, with another club that was in a Premier League, when QPR come in, it was just a natural action that just everything in me said I had to do it. I, I was. My head was ruling my heart by saying, like yeah. you said, it's the Premier League, it's your career. But just playing for QPR was just, it's just an override. In fact, as I said, I just got, I think I'd only been married a, a month. I've been married a month. I had a, I had a baby on the way. So it was hard. It was a, yeah. like that decision financially. But once I just made my mind up, I think I, I took about, it must have been half a day and I was like, no, I've got to do it. And then I uh, had a, I had a meeting with Ian Holloway in the office uh, at QPR. The old office used to be at the back by the school end and used to look out. And then he started to talk about the club's history. And I went, uh, Ollie, let me stop you there. I'll probably tell you more than you ever know. And I literally put my contract down that I had uh, and said, look, please get near that and I'll come. And being in League One, the first of all, they said no, they couldn't. And then they come back and done a bit of a deal. And then I, the only thing... That held me back a little bit was if it didn't go well, like if it yeah. didn't go well at QPR and like your love for the club and the fans and imagine if they started booing you, how would it affect my love for the club? Mm. But touch wood, it was it was all good and I, that's, and then again because the first few games I think I was booked three times and sent off like, in the first <laughs> four games. So That's I think that might, that, <laughs> might have had something, that might have had something to do with the hair as it goes. So Ollie, after like four games, asked me to change it back. And then the rest is history. Yeah, so go on. Fill us in. How did the blue and, the blue and white hair come about? How did that you wake up one morning and think, you know? Or... <laughs> no, no, well, it was always a pact, me and my brother Lee. Like we always said, if from the age of 10, we had this pact. If anyone played, if any, either of us played for QPR, we'd dye our hair blue and white. 
thinking what's the chances of it and then I remember we was in the RAF camp at Owlsbury so me and Kev first time okay. we've known each other all them years I was at QPR when I was nine so Kev was about 11 I think it was so we've known each other all that time sort of arguing who's the biggest QPR fan which <laughs> could easily me because I went to away games as I said before yeah. so but then I mean yeah I'd I bet with him 250 quid, I, I'd die at blue and white, knowing that I had to anyway, because I had the pack of my brother. So, uh, yeah, then died at blue and white for the first game. And it was a bit of a shock for the lads, I think, when I first came in, because only me and Kev really knew about it, that I said I was going to do it. And I had quite long hair at the time. So yeah. it was pretty just it come in, done that. And then it led to two years of being sponsored by Sportscoff and then by Fudge the second year. So, <laughs> and, then, and I only got, I only, I only got rid of it because of my brother's wedding. So oh, right. it was my brother's fault and pack that I had and that I was I was best man and the colour scheme that his wife had at the same the time was like cream and gold. So oh, the blue no, and white no, no. go with it. That's yeah, selfish so, about it. She well, should have had it blue and white theme to go with the hair. <laughs> yeah, but do you know what? Do you know what? So I went, yeah, and I dyed, I dyed it back normal. And do you know what? I forgot how much less stick you get from normal people without <laughs> the blue and white hair because you didn't have to be a big football fan to notice, oh, there's a player with blue and white hair, someone from QPR has blue and white hair, yeah. we're giving abuse. So like <laughs> Watford fans, Luton fans, Chelsea, especially Chelsea and Brentford, you yeah. used to get abused by Brentford fans all over the place. And then I used to give it, well, I've always liked Brentford, nice little club in Middlesex, got no problem with you. Yeah, they're like, not a West London Chelsea, club, so. <laughs> yeah, Chelsea, yeah, they're always annoys me, the West London derby, so. Yeah. Like West, well, we're technically the only real West London yes. club because of W12, because yes. Chelsea and Fulham are South London, yeah. Brentford and Middlesex. So, yeah, and so I dyed it back normal and then it was nice to not be abused and I thought, I'm probably getting a bit old. When I said I was a bit old, I think I was about 27, 28. <laughs> so I can't, I can't have the blue and white hair and then it just carried on to being nice. To be fair, I'm just quite happy I've still got my hair after abusing <laughs> it after all them years with the, that dying. No, it was worth it, it was worth it. Um, another question I'm quite interested in is what is it, obviously I've never been able to, I never will be able to fulfil my dream of playing for QPR, but what is it actually like playing for your boyhood club? Is it, is it added pressure for you and your family on the results? Or do you kind of feel a bit oh, yeah. where you can influence the results? Man, like, massively. You know, on a Saturday, massively. I can't... What, how, what's, it, what's it like? So, so to answer it, uh, the pressure on it is tenfold to, mm. to being a fan because it, it's, it's more down to you. Like when I was a player, but it, more as a coach, because as a player, I'm fully confident. The one thing that like people say about me I was just confident I knew what to do if mm. if the other player was better than me I knew I could drag him down to my level it was no problem like so I never got nerves in game but just getting him out of tickets like to get in games it was like 20 tickets a game for the family and just and if we lost it was like I'd get phone calls of more oh, what's the matter with us blah blah it's no good and then it was and then when I was at Millwall when I was at Mill, I used to play, I used to have a white t-shirt sometimes with a QBR like badge on. I used to play <laughs> with it. And I used to always say, I remember Gerard Lavin giving it this one game close and moving to QBR again. And that was at Mill. So and then when we used to come in from Mill, first result was I had a QBR get on. So uh, yeah. when you <laughs> when you lose the QBR, you can't come in and ask for another result and pick you up. It's <laughs> that. But but the nerves and pressure was more when I was a coach at QPR yeah. because you can prepare and when they go out there, it's up to them and it, yeah, your hands are in the life of the players. And mm. as I said, I'm less, you're less in control. When you're a player and you're quite an influential player on the team, it, maybe you just subconsciously feel more in control. But as yeah. a coach, it's just, it's more nervous. I, was, I, got, I, got nerv I got nervous a few times as a coach, but never as a player. Right. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. Um, let's move along. Um, I've got a question from Sam AR2. Uh, what was your favourite moment as a QPR player? Well, of course, you, you got the volley at Brentford. That was good to keep <laughs> us <laughs> to keep us in the playoffs. Uh, signing, and I remember signing and being given the training kit, like just. It's something I used to buy all the time. And then the first game, I'm on the cover of the programme where 
Yeah. You used to pay to go to football tournaments and they put a fake face on the front of the program and you're like, yeah. oh, this is real. So look, yeah. that was that that hit home. When when I actually seen myself in the program in a QPR kit, it was like I've made it. It's like, yeah, I can imagine walking to dressing room but, with your name on one of the shirts and putting it on. It must have just been surreal. It must have been surreal. Yeah. But again, still as a player, I was still always buying kits for my kids, the older QPR kits, like the lampshades, the curtain. Because like me and my brother, it was like a shrine to QPR. Our bedroom, <laughs> I mean, like, I think, I, mean, I, think, I think, yeah, well, yeah, I'm talking like, curtains, lampshade. I mean, we even had the crappy QPR like initial rings with QPR on like the play, the fake gold. Like where we had we had the orange influence kit, like every kit. Well, I've still got them at home, like every kit that come out. Yeah. And it only stopped when I went to Millwall. So that was 94 because like we'd go home and away, home and away all the time. And but I think hands down the best memory was Sheffield went their way. I think after the disappointment of the player final. Yeah. And coming towards the end of the year and I think because there was just so much pressure I've been I've been told that the day before the Swindon game at home uh, it was because we played Plymouth away I said I got I got concussed on the pitch split me head open it was nil-nil come off so I remember that's the first time I fell out with Holloway like it was uh, it was nil-nil I remember being knocked out on the floor got kneed on the head or kicked in the head and I remember being knocked out. I woke up and then Pav, uh, uh, Pav the physio was there and I grabbed him and went, I weren't knocked out. He went, he was. I went, I weren't. That, and I literally threatened him with his life, <laughs> giving it, if you tell him I'm knocked out. I went, just, and so they taped it up and it went on for about 10 minutes. I can't remember, I can't really remember playing that 10 minutes. And then I looked, they, they stopped me. And as I was coming off, I remember swearing at Ollie, giving it, what the fuck I'm doing, there's nothing wrong with me. And then he was like saying, just, um, it's got, and we were arguing on the side and she sat down spewed up and then and he looked like, like yeah, I told you he was knocked out and I went in and the doctor was stitching my eye, eye up the Plymouth doctor and they scored so they was when lit and he ran and cheered and he was like so I literally grabbed oh, him by the throat pulled him down and said, don't <laughs> you ever move when you're and to be fair when he, when he was stitching they scored a game and he literally oh. didn't move like, like nothing happened stitching so yeah it come well, he'll, need a, he'll need a few more stitches himself if uh, yeah, he celebrated I, that I, one. I, just, I, was, I was fuming. I was fuming. So <laughs> then, to go into the story, then on the way back on the coach, so like stitches on my, in my head, quite a few, a uh, bit concussed. Brian Tinian from Bristol City is texting Tony Thorpe, giving it unlucky, well done. You can. We're watching, we're watching the playoffs in Spain. So, like, fuming, fuming. Coming Monday, they're talking about, I might not be out of play because I was knocked out. So, concussion protocol, right. get a nice one. Yeah. So, then on the Friday, get a call from, was it Bill Power? Was, uh, yeah, Bill Power was talking about, it was mainly Gianni. And then they tell me, probably not the best mental preparation you can have. They said, look, if we don't go up, we can't afford you. So, right. you bet you got to win the next two games to go up. I was like, oh, added to all that, Swindon were third or fourth in the league. Yeah. And I think looking back, that was probably one of my best games for QPR at that time. I think with that added pressure, and we won that game, then went up to Sheffield Wednesday. So then I've got Neil Walnut. So Neil Walnut was manager of Sheffield at the time. He's tried to sign me a few times. He's yeah. been in me giving it QPR, has got no money, come to us, I'll make you a better player, blah, blah, blah. Rings me up the night before in the hotel at Sheffield, give it, I'm going to show him up, job on a sign ya. I'm coming to Sheffield Wednesday to watch ya and hope you lose. He said, it's one of the first times I want Sheffield Wednesday to win because then I can sign ya. I was like, oh, cheers, well, thanks for the prep talk on that one. So it was just all the build up, and like pay from family to go up there on the coach and just when you come out of the warm up and you see that end, yeah. when you see that end was that packed, it was something weird, something flipped. And then in my head, we was never losing that game. Just never. Like even, I don't know, it was just a calmness fell over me. And I remember saying to Kev, we're never losing this. We've got it. And then I think we really added them because of Danny Wilson being Bristol City manager, them flashing up the Bristol City score they scored. Yeah. Now, to be fair, that's a lie. There was a one time in the game I thought, oh, it, hang on a minute. That was two minutes into the game. I remember the ball had gone up in the air. I've called it first of all. I'm going to edit. And then, boom, from behind, Clark Carlisle's coming. 
and like his knee's gone into my leg. So now I've got a dead leg. I'm thinking, I'm not, I could hardly move. <laughs> so like, I said to the physio again, give me some, I gave him some verbal abuse, Clark, which I said, sorry, <laughs> afterwards. Like, is he still drunk or are you still drinking again, Clark? Some, some along them lines. And then I think as soon as we scored the first goal, Kev, it was just, we was never going to lose it. And just to see so many away fans that day and the relief. And I think the final whistle, I missed the first bit of the dressing room because I don't know what came over me. I just went pat cash. I went straight into the away end up, climbed up the stairs. Yeah. And was just with, like, with, with my family. And that was the second time I'd ever seen my dad cry. Like, literally. First one was uh, at Ivory in the 82 semi final when right, yeah. we beat West Brom. So I'm only a kid, I'm only four. Yeah. And I thought he'd hurt himself. I didn't know at that time, <laughs> like, because I've never seen my dad cry as a man's man. And then yeah. he was just crying, saying we're going to Wembley. And that's so them two times, just, yeah, it was just brilliant. And then just as a team, we was, I think we was out drunk for, for, for a week after that, went to Dublin and just an amazing time. Yeah, you, you so, get onto the question perfectly there from uh, Ian Wilcox. He wanted to know, did the lads get on it early or have a delayed party? So PS, thanks for the memories, Birch. Uh, no, because I remember on the pitch, Sky Sports News on the pitch, and they said, oh, what's your plans coming up? I said, well, I'm going to be drunk for a week. And that <laughs> was it. And then somehow I agreed. It was my wife's 30th birthday, then, and I hired a nightclub out in London for, for us all. So we literally, I still had my top on. Gareth, Gareth was full kitted up. He was full kit <laughs> angry. He even had the shit. <laughs> Even at the shin pads. Oh, on. no. Like, so, I, I, I think I had shirt and shorts on, the trainers. Uh, I think Rowley still had his top on. We didn't even... I don't think we got showered. That's how bad it was. I, 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 I don't... Showered in champagne, showered. but nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, we, yeah, I'm sure we didn't get showered. because We must have been stinking because you wouldn't have got showered and put your dirty kit on. Yeah. So, yeah. So, then the, we took or everyone, the whole... Lucky we won, we took everyone straight to the nightclub, all off. So it was a massive celebration. Yeah. Went, went on all night. And I remember, I think we got back at about six or seven. I remember like half eight, door game, bang, bang, bang. I was like, what? who is this? Opened it up, Sky Sports News. Because <laughs> I'd agreed the day before. I think I must have been drunk. Yeah, come round to the no problem. So yeah. come round. It was like half eight to do a live interview, about half nine. And so done that. And then, must have, I was still steaming at that time, and then we went, we went from there up the road from us. Our fitness coach, Scotty, our fitness coach at the pub. Don't know if that works, but our fitness coach at the pub. So we all went there, celebrated, <laughs> and then uh, the, from before that, I was in London. Had to do they done live like roundups on the Sunday at ITV. So I was there talking about it, and literally was still ready to pretend to be a water. I think it was a vodka there. So we just went through. For the pub, and then the next day we went to, we went. Well, they organised the open top bus. Yeah, we said we did, but they said we went. We booked Ireland. We got in five days. So then it was a bit of confusion. So they delayed it, and then that that day, great open top bus. We were thought like cute, I could have an open top bus, and we only won league one. We're not getting excited, but I think it was. I think it's because of all the heartache and hardship we went through for the two or three years before to see that many people on the route was yeah. honestly it's like we won the FA Cup. That was like <laughs> where it felt with the fans. Yeah, you're getting on uh, winning winning a trophy there. Now let's let's get on to this one. QPR European champions. How about that? Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> and it's not the Arbifa we, Cup. It's the Copa de Arbifa out here. <laughs> Copa de Arbifa. I mean. I remember when they told us at the end of that season that like, we're going pre-season in our beef and we're like, they're a nice one. And it was like pre-season our beef. And then, like I said before, when we went over there, Ollie, Ollie was over there with two, three days with his family beforehand. Yeah. And we, what happened, we got paid money to go. So, again, money was always tight with QBR then. So, mm. even if it was in like Timbuktu, we'd have gone if it was money. So, they paid the most money to give us. And, Coventry was there, Huddersfield was there, us, and I'd be the town. And we got to the hotel the first night, and then they gave it, it's a shambles, all training and uh, games were on this plastic pitch, rubbish. It don't <laughs> like, don't cut, have a drink. They're, you're just not allowed at the hotel. And then from that <laughs> m- moment on, it was a bit like a stag do, but uh, <laughs> they, we, we, uh, 
But yeah, we, we played the game. I remember the first game. I think I scored the first or second against IB for town. And the smiling assassin that is Paul Furlong started another 22 man brawl. So like, he, someone's elbowed him, he's two footed him, and then we're fighting his weights from IB for town that is, uh, in the game. And then, the, and then the, the famous final against Coventry. Oh my was, gosh. What was that like? So we, I mean, so you know that at half time, everyone's scrapping. I'm sure you like to be in yeah. the scrap. <laughs> Yeah, well, exactly. Well, again, there was well, loads of friends and family out there, and there's about there was honestly there was about over a thousand QPR fans, mm. and a few hundred Coventry fans. And like Pete Do- Doherty is asked to get us tickets, so we gave him. Don't know what state he was in because we never see him, so I don't know what he was <laughs> doing the singer. So he was might not make it to the game. Uh, yeah, I, who knows? But yeah, so half time it's two nil, and then the fans start fighting. So Mickey Adams. But one, the commentary lot are fuming because they've not had one night out because it was <laughs> it was after Mickey Adams with the Leicester lot in Marbella. So yeah. he was on strict rules. They're like, we've not had a night in, really. So the fans start fighting. Mickey Adams goes on there. You're a disgrace. What are you doing? It's only a friendly, blah, blah, blah. Slaughtering them and it's like, calm down. So then... Ollie gave it, yeah. So Ollie's got the mic and oh, gave man. it. I know, I know it's a final. I know we're two 0 down, but with QBR, and we're going to give it a right good go second half. <laughs> and they just gave it, yeah. Started fighting the game, and we're like, oh, here we go. So like, and then that was the that was the thing. Talk that if you win this one, then there's, there's no curfew. You just get to the airport at ten in the morning. And well, more incentive to do Yeah, well, we, we were one three two. The cup was shaped like the European Cup. It was like fireworks, <laughs> and we're celebrating it. Literally, got on the RB for champions, champions of Europe. Yeah, <laughs> I can uh, yeah and, and I think we're still holders because they never played it again after that. <laughs> Reigning champions of Europe. Cup but I got to say, I went for it. For every day out there, we paid for it when we got back. It was the hardest two weeks pre <laughs> I think I've ever had with Oli. Uh, right, you're touching on just my next topic there. Um, what was it like to work with Holiday? I mean, uh, Holiday, sorry, Ian Holloway. Um, yeah, he's he's holiday. <laughs> um, we see he raises his heart on his sleeve, so honest, he's transparent. But what is it that he really gets everybody behind him? How does he quite manage that? I think because he is so honest and he, he treated everyone the same, whether he's the main player the team, whether he's a squad player. Mm. He was just so honest. And like all the coaches and managers I worked for, the main essence is you've got to get a squad wanting to play for you. And that's what Neil Warnock and Ian Holloway have had uh, yeah. under the people that I've played and, and worked for. They, they get a squad and they're, they're clever as well with their recruitment because we had a team that policed itself. So Ollie didn't have to be the, the firm, strong manager with, with massive discipline because we, we, we had control of fines. We disciplined the dressing room. You had strong characters there. Mm. Like me and Kev that had grown up at QPR. Then we recruited Martin Rowlands, Gareth Ainsworth, Danny. So we had Danny yeah, Shippen, Clark, Furs, like just men. Like Biggie was in there we had Lee Cook later on and just it, you look back now and they're like a, it was like a team full of captains like I think individually nearly all of us captained other teams or, or, or teams so it, it just controlled themselves and we looked like anyone was out of line we'd pull them up on it and and they could literally go to Ollie as a player and he'd like put an arm around them so that's yeah. what he was good at so but what he what he got he got instead of like the people that are playing every week, he got a whole squad, he, and he got the club behind him, the staff, yeah. and everyone. And I think it was a, it was a, we united it. I think me, me and Kev probably helped at the start, like he said, uniting the fans because the fans were, were what we've been through. There was a bit, there was a bit weather beaten, really. Yeah. <laughs> I had men not doing well in the doldrums, probably the lowest we've been in, in absolute in fifty years, really, and. Yeah. I think we just galvanised it and we, uh, the fans got us, we got the fans because yeah. of our links and it just kicked on from there. No, I know. It's quite interesting that, you know, two real periods of uncertainty, like before his, his first spell at QPR and his second spell, he's come in, stabilised the ship, got the fans reunited and got, the, got our Rangers back. Really. We got our passion back for our club. Um, and it's yeah, something you can take real pride in. And I say, like, like you've said, you were a big part of that. And again, a big part of the second 
period as well as uh, assistant manager, but we'll touch upon that in just a second. Uh, before that, coming in as caretaker and then coach in 2009, how did that, how did that feel? How did that come about, that coming back to QPR after, after his spell as a player? Yeah. Well, it's, it's well documented. I spoke about it, how me and Gianni fell out when I was a player because it wasn't run properly. I think when, when they put Ollie on gardening leave, we had to do this press conference at Loftus Row with Gary Waddock coming in, which I refused to do because nothing against Gary Waddock at the time. It was how they treated Ollie wasn't right. They, yeah. they let him talk to Leicester. He didn't want to go, so the deal fell through. But then the, the Italian way, if you talk to another club, then what you're saying is you want to leave. So all that was going on. I just thought they should have sacked him. Everything he'd done, they should have sacked Ollie, not put him on the gardening leave. Mm. So... I, I stood strong with there, and then I think that was the start of me and Gianni falling out because I, I just wouldn't have that. And then it ended up with me like choking him out, really, a little bit, which wasn't my finest moment. But it was yeah. a game that I, I got on really well with John Gregory when he came in. So I was captain at the time, and I got, I got on really well with him. He hated my mate Kev for some reason, but yeah, he got on well with me, and I was really struggling with my hamstrings. And my back, if people don't know, I've got like a double fracture in my back, probably playing all in years. So it used to affect my back and hamstrings. And there was one game, we, we played Wolves at home. Wolves just come down from the Prem and it was nil-nil. And I, I'm trained in like two weeks. And I'm playing, I could feel my hamstring cramping up and it was going to go. And I battled on for the like next five minutes. So there's, a, there's only about eight minutes left. And I've had to say, look, it's going to go, I've got to come off. And that's, that's against everything I believe in, because normally I, I play on everything, but literally, yeah. it was, I didn't know if it was cramp or it was going to pull, come off. And I think Wolf scored in the last minute. So it was like either 1 0, and it was 1 all, or they ended up winning 1 0. Yeah. So next game was Luton at home in the FA Cup. And like we agreed, John Gregory, look, be sub if we need you, you come on just to say the answering. And then in the program notes, Johnny wrote, Oh, fantastic. No, we definitely drew because they, we won new up and we won all. Yeah. Because he wrote, well, fantastic performance, good draw. Shame the so-called QPR fans let us down who were meant to be playing because they left their team out. And I'm reading it like fuming. So like, <laughs> I've, gone, I've, gone, I've gone up to John Gregory at the time. I went, Gap, what the... He went, leave it with me. I'll deal with it. I was like, no problem. So I'm fuming, fuming. Weren't going well against Luton. I think I come on just after half time. We was losing one nil, drew one all, get the replay. I got man of the match. So uh, as you, at QPR, you used to go up in the lift to the sponsors lounge to get the trophy and speak to the press. And then as it was going up, it opened up on the chairman's suite. So okay. no, I got it on the way down. It opened up on the chairman's suite, and I had the award. And he's like, "Oh, Johnny, oh, you won man the match." Oh, your family vote. You can, you can do anything. You can sneeze and get man in the match. It's a disgrace. So then I just gave up. I said some words and then just <laughs> and started like choking him outside the chairman suite. So it was in front of his family and like it's all screaming. Imagine Italians, they go yeah. over the top anyway. <laughs> but I, but he came, I was choking him and I weren't letting go. And then security got me off. And then next day, I think we went in Monday at training. And John Gregory just went, maybe you could have handled that better, Birch. I went, yeah, but it was worth it. You know, he was <laughs> trying to get me, I, he, I, he was trying to get me a new deal to stay. But then at the time I knew that that was it. And then I, I think I played against Southampton, my, my hamstring went again. And that's when I just I put my hands up and that's the back operation, which I, I should have been out six months with it. But I got back within... I think just the four months just so I could play the last game against Stoke because I think with me arguments with Gianni he didn't want me to play uh, he didn't want me to have a send off so John Gregory put me sub and then I remember the lads because we stayed up they went to Marbella for a week to celebrate but I because I wanted to play the last game I stayed done my rehab played a couple of reserve games to then come on the in, I think I come on the last 10-15 minutes of the game just to say goodbye but first I would never let him forget that. He could have just squared it to me and I could have just tapped it in against uh, Stoke. I got the ball, I played him through and then I've run and he's a bit on an angle and he only has to square it in typical for uh, typical centre for all these shots. So I remind him <laughs> of that all the time. But yeah, but I managed to, I managed to have the send off and that's 
I've got to thank John Gregory for that because I think he was being told not to. So anyway, so me and Johnny fell out. He was telling everyone that my back weren't no good, so there was deals falling through. But I was I was meant to go. I signed for like Galaxy, so that's when when Bex was over there. My ex Canadian uh, manager was there, Frank Yala, who's a really good friend of me now. We're who I've coached with, and then. Uh, my wife then at the time, probably that's why I divorced her later, well, because she wouldn't move to LA. So she was pregnant at the, she was pregnant at the time. She wouldn't move to LA. And then I ended up signing a decent deal for Yeovil at the time. Yeovil, yeah. So, yeah. It was, but I think uh, my heart wasn't in it. I think I knew I was injured. I, I was trying to, the first thing, I was trying to prove everyone wrong I could come back. But you speak to anyone. When you're injured, you have that first period of denial. No, I'm nothing wrong with me. I'm going to show them. And then it takes like, six months to hit in. And I was on painkillers. I was doing acupuncture, these stretches, going to see this specialist aspect just to get through games. I was seeing other lads that were playing cards and PlayStation. And yeah. I was doing it to get back and play for Yeovil. And I yeah. think my heart was, when I left QPR, it, it, it honestly would have rather played for my brother's team in non league because. That it was just it weren't it weren't the passion that I was yeah. used to and it weren't like it weren't life or death then and knowing that I was injured and literally I like, retired and ended up playing for my brother's uh, some uh, Sunday non league team so but yeah I think that was the part of it so falling out with Gianni was that was a big thing but we had a mutual friend and then when I retired the thing with Gianni you can now like people know him like he, he's hot and cold you fall out with him or not and then he offered me to come back as youth team to work with. Steve Gannon and we had a we had a great youth set up and loved that time there. Such hard work. Some days were twelve hour days, like it was like really hard work. Because if you think of the academy system now and how much they spend on them, we spent two hundred and fifty grand from under nines up to under eight and that's all we spent on it. And it was we had three full time members of the staff. It was me, Steve Gannon and the physio. Jesus Christ. And so part time and you look at the players that have come through that, like even like good pros, you, you, we go from that team, you know, Michael Harriman, Maxima, still still yeah. playing league football now, Michael Doughty, Frankie Sutherland, who was great. Yeah, Frank, Frankie Sutherland had great ability. You had Bruno Andre, yeah. Jordan Gibbons ended up playing league football. Uh, Jamie Sandals White ended up playing league football. Even the, the ones that a little bit old there, Lee Brown, still playing at Portsmouth. Yeah. And like you could just, you could just read it off and we, we had done that with nothing. And of course, Raheem come through, which made us millions because yeah. we sold him for a million when he was 16. Because, of course, it was Liverpool and then we had got a 15% sell-on. So when he went to Man City, that, that kept the club going at the time. So for what we'd done there, it was, it was brilliant because what we, so what we were spending, so what we were producing, it was, it was fantastic and loved every minute. I mean, Steve being really good mate, just enjoyed every day. And then, Jim McGilton was magnificent as a manager, but I think we played some of the best football under Jim. I, I don't, mm. people forget about that period. Like when he came out, I remember he was beating middles for five, one at home and four nils and playing absolute football and John Gorman, who was assistant and great times. We, and what Jim used to do as well, we used to have a staff match every Friday. Like used to get a bit taken. <laughs> like everyone in. Uh, yeah, we used to get a bit t- And that was great, but it brought all the staff together. We're talking about the chef, he's coming out. He's having a game, <laughs> like physios, the lot. Uh, we had a, we had a very, uh, what was it, keep our vicar. He tried, he'd come down and said, can I ref a game? And like, <laughs> oh God. The, the abuse he got. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. The abuse he got. I think yeah, he, he didn't come back after the second time. And, and Can't so, think yeah, why. But, <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, but it, it was a great time. And it, so then Jim, Jim got sat. We had an FAU Cup game. So me and Steve were taking the team against Southampton. But even with their stars, like we beat them in the FA Cup that game. But before the game, because we was at the Watford game the day before, we know what Jim had put his head towards Akas Bazaki, but that's all it was. It was like a head to head and then pushed yeah. him off with his head. And the one person you probably don't want to head to is your Vakos. He's got a massive head. It's like a mascot <laughs> head. So if it, if it was an head butt, there was only one winner. But Jim's pushed him away and then he's come out. So where the Watford dressing room used to be, he's come out and it was the tunnel and he's oh, he's head butted me. And then it's all kicked off. And then it was weird the next day. So me and Steve weren't there because we had the FA Youth Cup game. 
But then the file counts in the meeting, the whole staff was there and they said, oh, we've sat Jim McGilton and John Gorman, you're going to be manager. And he's like, I can't be. Like, I'm with Jim, you can't give. Okay, no problem, you're sacked. Uh, and it was, uh, Keith, uh, Keith Ryan was with him. No problem, Keith, you can be it. And uh, file accounts, John Gorman's looking at him and he's like, well, I can't really, no problem, you're sacked. We get, we get Bertie and Steve to take it. And then, so we didn't know this till after the game. So after the game, you've seen beat Southampton. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. we've got to take the team. Like, just been beat at Watford. I think it was 3 or 4-1. And then we've got West Brom away. The top of the league, you're live on the sky. So they're like, oh, God, we'll enjoy it. Might as well, we go in there. So but we're literally coaching the first team, then in the afternoon coaching the youth team. Oh. Then we're coaching the first team, driving and the minibus, the reserves have got a game. So, so we're literally, we're the only two there really with the, with the uh, physios and staff. And of course you've got the cameras for your plan there with Matt and our talk, I, we got friendly with. So it's like, <laughs> I don't want to be in this because I thought it was going to be shameful. So I signed, I didn't want to be in it. So, but, but like I've said before, with the, we knew, we knew Slav was going to want to pick his players, the Pelicoris, the Albertis, yeah. or it, so we, me and Steve gave it, right, we can play this. We're talking in a way so we describe what team we want to play. So he's giving it, yeah, Pelicori, like he's got to play, he can score goals with his dick. He can score goals with his dick. He's a goal scorer. Um, not many centre forwards score that. Can he score with his head or feet? It'd be a lot better. And then yeah. anyway, we talk, talked him into the team that we wanted to play, which was mainly the English ones. So the was in there. Like we, we go up there and give it a go. And then that's when he went, like, oh. And he said to Gian in Italian, like, tell him, tell him. And Gian was like, oh, but yeah, if we're winning to waste time, make subs. Okay, yeah, I'll bring subs on there. They had it on anyway, but yeah, I know what yeah. I'll bring subs. And if we're winning, like in, I think he said to ring or something, he said, you go down, you hold your chest. <laughs> and then it all that, and then the doctors come on and they stretch you off, and then we win the game. I was like, what? So we had the fitness coach couldn't lay, we had Steve Gunn. They're looking at me. I'm like, so the only time we're probably going to manage my boyer club live on Sky, you want me to have an heart attack? <laughs> an heart attack on the side of it. And they're like, no, 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 chest pains. So, oh, it's chest pains and then, oh, it's indigestion. And then we put it down, and then we put it down to nerves and panic attack. So you want me to say I've got a panic attack in the last minutes because it all got too much of it. Just jeopardise your career. Yeah, and then it was like, yeah, 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 because it wastes time. I was like, yeah, I'll think about that one. No problem. You could and just then, get someone to keep the ball in the corner flag, but I mean, yeah, why not have a panic attack instead? Well, when you say keep it in the corner flag, so we're there and then literally first 10 minutes, Radic right, Cherney takes a goal kick, he kicks the ground and he, he does his ankle ligaments. And we're like, oh, here we go. So I'm like, I don't know, he was, he was okay, but we're like, we can't make a sub now already. So, like, we've gone out there. He had the old fashioned, he had the old fashioned tape over the boot and his ankle, like, just to strap him up to half time. So, we had that, and then we've gone, worked on a couple of set pieces, a couple of days before it's come off, we're winning. Then 2 0 up. And then in the second half, Cambio, Cambio, shouting down, oh, James, James. Okay, Pelicori, on you come. And it was Pellicoli and Ali Fallin who weren't having the best of times. Yeah. So we brought him on. So it's 2 1, and it's, it gets into the 98 night minute, right? So and you had some really weird chest pain. That box with <laughs> <laughs> no, che no, well, we, no chest pain. So it's coming to me, I've given it. They want me to have chest pain. Oh, yeah. If we don't win, and I don't have some chest pains, I'm banging it. But <laughs> Ali's got the ball, and he's played. So Ali should either run it in the corner. Or smash it in the stand. But he's played Pelicori for it. So Pelicori is one on one. So we run it in the corner. Game over. <laughs> he's had a shot. Dean Kylie's caught it. Booted it. Flick on. Simon Cox goal. Two all last minute. And so two all. We're finishing this game. So we get him in the change room. We're like, yeah. We've had a couple of days of If you'd have us 2 2 before the game, we'd have beat round. Blah, blah, that's fine. Well, the door bursts open. So then in they come, the Italians. They <laughs> are losing. Like straight <laughs> to, straight to Pellicori, losing their shit. Whatever they're saying. All I know is they ain't saying well done. So they're coming up. <laughs> the Vafan Kulu's coming now. And, bah, 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 bah. 
And then as they turn around, they turn around, I mean, Steve, excellent, well done, brilliant. And then out they go. So I said to Ali, Ali, what'd they say to Pelicori there? Uh, and they said, like, hopefully your house catches on fire because you will die because you're too slow to run out the house. And, you're, and so you'll just die and you'll burn alive and you'll never play QPR again. See you later. And that was it. That was, <laughs> this, and so this is all recorded. So remember, the cameras are with us, but that's, they, uh, Flav had final edit, so he, that never made it in. So that, uh, that's on the unedited version. But yeah, so that was the run game. And then the next day, a couple of days later, they said we're bringing Paul Hart in and Mick Hartford. And mm. then it was, I think Mick Hartford after that, then it was Neil Warnock. And then when Neil Warnock came in, I thought, oh, I could be in trouble here because I've turned him down a few times yeah. to go to his club. And then hey, when he came in, he said, oh, you finally get to work for me now. So that was all right. <laughs> so I was like, Phew. Yeah, but maybe he did have a heart attack, you'd have maybe got the job. But um, oh, yeah, exactly. That, that's what happened. So when the owners tell you, no, it weren't a heart attack, chest pain. So, chest pain. Yeah, so indigestion, yeah. indigestion. <laughs> so, so I've, I've learned my next job. If the, if the owners want a heart attack, they're getting full blown heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god what a story um so yeah like you said touching on some of the other managers coming in there um some monumental highs and lows of your time as a coach behind the scenes and you seeing directly some of the stuff that i don't even really want to talk about and relive because some of it's just true and utterly ridiculous but we'll start off a bit positive what's one of your sort of favorite moments as being a coach or uh, taking the under 23s throughout that period of your time 23s are great because as i said i've been with them or I've been with them all the way up from uh, under 14s, really. I really yeah. think Darnell, Dar- I think Darnell was under 13, under 14 when he was first in there. Yeah. And even with Darnell, Darnell was great because he was always small for his age. He was a centre forward and midfield. He's getting a bit overpowered. And then I think it was that in the under 16s. Probably weren't going to get a scholarship at the time because he wasn't performing as well. He was like, don't have that. Try play right back because everything's in front of you. You're out the hustle and bustle. And then from there, he's kicked on to be a Premier League right back. So, yeah. and it's brilliant. And um, I love that because being so close to his dad and seeing him kicking about on the field and they used to come like, yeah. after games sometimes then to see, to be in yeah, the team. Like, like, me, and me and Ollie are coaching him. It was like, yeah, that, one, you think, fuck, I'm old. But then two, <laughs> like... <laughs> Yeah, like just looking after him and, and just seeing what, what a great lad he, he turned out to be. But just seeing any players make their debut that have come through the system. And what's good is that still keeping contact with loads of them lads, whether they've got birthdays, weddings, christenings, to still get the invite. I think, I say before, without the winning and everything, I think that where you have, you realise you have so much influence over young people's careers. And that that's, the sign of success when you're still in contact with them, they still ask for advice in all these years. I think yeah. that, that, that for me, that is the, that is the big carrot for when I was at QPR for the 23 and, and seeing them come in the team and, and do so well. Yeah, that, that must be so rewarding with Don. I like you say, because you weren't just the under 23s manager where, you know, you gave him a couple of games there and you got him into the first side. Like you say, you, you were the only three people employed. You had to sort out the under, under 12s. Yeah. It must have been, I must, like you say, it must be no, so, you- I can't imagine. No, no, after the West Brom game, they, I remember going in the room and Dimiteo and Eddie Newton there, so nine them through, through other friends and like, they're de- de- disappointed. They're like, oh, we're going to get the boys in and analyse the game tomorrow. What are you doing tomorrow? And we're like, oh, we're driving a minibus for the reserves. We've got all this shot away. Yeah. And they started laughing. No, no, what are you going to do? And we're like, no, no, no. Like, we're driving a minibus. We've got reserves. We're playing all this shot away. So that was like... And to be fair, we played Raheem. I think Raheem was like 15 at the time. We played him in the reserves at all the shot. I think it was at all, I think our reserve games were at all the shot, but we was playing someone else. But yeah, so that was like from there to there. And it was just as enjoyable. But you cleaning the kits yeah. as well. You must like, was there anything you weren't doing? <laughs> no, yeah, we were picking up the kits. We weren't cleaning it. We had cleaning it. So it weren't like, but literally it was like doing it all. Like, yeah. Oh, God. Um... Yeah, so some mental lows as well. I mean, Adele's a straining order, Armand bringing tear gas to the training ground. Um, yeah. Just some, like, you must have just seen some absolutely ridiculous things in that time. Like, yeah, I think, but I've always said, like, QPR is a bit of a spiff club, as in always a bit wheeling and dealing. And from, from Jim Gregory, the last owner, I think he was a wheeling and dealer. And it's always been like that. And yeah. 
it's always been other than the like the Premier League years where I was growing up, where we were spoiled and you had the Venable yeah. years. Even Ven- Terry Venable's what a legend, but a bit of a spear for him. Like yeah, as a that was my hero as a coach, what's you got and then we after the Premier League, it just seemed to be like we was always in the news for non football reasons and it was yeah. just always cute yeah. If something's going wrong, cute girl be involved. Yeah. Or if everything's going right and there's a way of fucking it up, cute girl would find it. <laughs> That's it. And yeah. it was like just at that time and it was just it all seemed a bit too good to be true. And normally when things are a bit too good to be true, then normally not that good and Again, I, I think now as a QPR fan, I'm talking as a QPR fan now. Yeah. Sometimes I'm a bit happier being in the championship. It's a bit yeah, more real. Completely agree. I just think, agree. I just think like being being in the Premier League, it's just like I don't know. Like when when we've been, it's like little QPR, and yeah. I'm happy with that but because. Growing up, QPR was always everyone's second team. It was like so many people like QPR. One, because we got the best kit in the world. I think the blue and white hoops is like amazing. Anyone thinks of blue and white hoops, they think of QPR. And I think Loftus Road is people's favourite ground, even though like you dislocate your knees when you're in the stand sitting down because they're that tight. And <laughs> and, it, and it's just a ground everyone loves. And we went from everyone's second club to everyone hating us yeah. because of the millions and because of trying to be a bit flash under probably Bria to start with and then we moved on to just mm-hmm. signing a conveyor belt of players who don't care about the club coming in. I think from that, I just, I think now like you get your true QPR fans coming to the ground. You get your your hardcore 15,000 that would be there even like we was in League One. Yeah. You just get 15,000 there. So, I just think, yeah, where we are, we are what we are at the minute. That yeah. I've always said before that it's more of a family disease that's passed down because you don't <laughs> get too many highs out of it. Like you, no. you, you easily fall. To me, but I'd say cute. Yeah, I can get how cults work. I, I yeah. get it now. Wade Cobra and all these cults because you get brainwashed. Like when I was a kid, I literally thought QPR were one of the best teams in the world. Like I honestly did. Like. Real Madrid, Barcelona, Inter Milan, yeah. maybe Man U, maybe Man U, Liverpool, Arsenal, maybe. Then it was like QPR, Tottenham. Like we're probably better than them. Like, mm. but my, my like my favourite player was John Byrne, and I remember we had a caravan in Clapton, and I it was on the back page like Burns going to QPR. I remember bawling my eyes out like I've got like my hero's gone. I, yeah. I, I think I had, I think I had a highlighted little mullet at the time for John Burke. <laughs> of course. And then like, <laughs> like but in my in my head, oh don't be a traitor, John. Like why would you take a step sideways and go to Man U? So in my head, <laughs> like Man U is a sideward step. And yeah. I, I I remember when Andy Sinton left to Sheffield Wednesday, yeah. like my mind's blown, gone. Why would you leave QPR and go to a smaller club like Sheffield Wednesday? Like that for me, it was like you know I'm going a division down, like, but you don't realise like Sheffield Wednesday is massive and like you're, you're getting three times the amount of money. But yeah. in my head, as a kid, like they weren't on the same planet as QPR. <laughs> as I said, like we're probably just below, but touching you in the Milan's and that. That is <laughs> that 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 was me. Like, you know, like uh, but again. That's why a lot of QPR fans probably should work for cult or terrorist recruitment groups because <laughs> the amount of people I've talked in supporting QPR, like I've convinced them <laughs> to support this team. That's they think they would get that, don't they? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, but they say, but even now, like even with my junior schools and my, at, at the high schools, like well, I've got loads of mates that are QPR fans that normally it's passed down from it, but we're good recruiters, QPR fans. I think yeah. a lot of fans normally grab two or three that they convince to be QPR fans. But if you wrote a contract saying, look, you're going to support a team, over 75% time, it's going to be not good. You're never going to win a major trophy. You're never even going to get close to winning the Premier League. Oh, let's not forget like, European champions. <laughs> they are European champions, that's yeah. right. <laughs> but you've got to sign up for this contract for life. Yeah. And you're never ever gonna win anything. <laughs> no. Okay, yeah, def- definitely. Like, if you put it like, yeah, oh, that's fun. But, yeah. but we do, and we and we moan about it. And now uh, they're rubbish. I'm not gonna watch them again. And then comes to yeah. Thursday, you can't wait to see them again. But I, I always say, 
don't really get emotional, but I know I'm going on a different one. Out of all the times I've played QPR, coached QPR, without getting emotional, even like taking, to, so I'm a meal assistant manager and, like, and then I buy 25 tickets to go to the player final. So yeah. going and then going mental. Is, uh, and I remember we all putting that that's not the right thing to do. But in my own time, it's everything. Yeah. That, that, yeah, is, yeah. that is, a, I've got my daughters with me, my son. Yeah. Like, like the whole family, 25 of us, and yeah. remember getting mental and like Kevin Hitchcock, who was the goalkeeping coach, said, like, yeah. give it, you can't be doing that. <laughs> but <laughs> Try to stop me. The <laughs> no, but the, the one time I did get emotional was when I was still in Arizona coaching, come back, and it was full of my way. And then I was in the away end, I think, because being away, and then it was like me, my dad, my brother, and my son just watching QPR and then I was like oh it reminded me of my time when I was a kid with my granddad my dad and me and then like so doing all that that was one of my best memories just being at a away game just us watching it thinking as a parent I've done my job he's, yeah. he's hooked as a QPR fan so yeah 